I'm going to begin now. And uh, thank you everybody for, for coming. Uh, I see a lot of new faces like in Cisco, Professor Smith has brought along, which is nice to see. Uh, for people who are new, my name is Charles Small. I'm the director of the Yale Initiative for the Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism. And as you can see uh, on your desks, there's some of our upcoming, upcoming programs and uh, lectures that are available to everybody who's welcome to the Yale community and to the public. So you're all welcome to come. Um, it's really I'm grateful for Professor Stephen Smith to be here today, and I'm especially grateful, as I say, on one level, is that Professor Smith was actually one of the first scholars at Yale University to be supportive of creating the Yale Initiative on Antisemitism at Yale, so we're grateful for that. And it's especially, we're especially grateful because actually Yale University is the first North American university to have a, an initiative or center of this kind, of, so it's special. Uh, today, Professor Smith will be speaking on Leo Strauss as a Jewish thinker. As many of you know, he's the Alfred Kells Professor of Political Science, and he's also the Master at Brantford College. He did his PhD at the University of Chicago, and within the Yale community, he held positions such as the Director of Graduate Studies, the Director of Undergraduate, uh, the Undergraduate Program in Humanities, and he was the actual Chair of the Day Studies. His research focuses on the history of political philosophy, the role of statecraft in the constitutional government and Jewish thought. He currently teaches a course of Leo Strauss and Strauss-Mindelum. He's the co-organizer of the conference of Macedonia, Philosophy, Rhetoric, and History, and he's editing the Cambridge Companion to Leo Strauss. He's also written recently a book uh, entitled Spinoza's Book of Life, and in 2006 he wrote a book entitled Reading Leo Strauss. So it's really an honor, and I'm really grateful that you're here. And today, Stephen Smith will be speaking about Leo Strauss as a Jewish man. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, attending. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for those kind words for the introduction. Uh, what I'm going to say uh, today actually does not have uh, really very much anything to do with anti-Semitism, although uh, I, I, I could have spoken, I suppose, about that. Strauss has been, uh, in some ways, the object of uh, certain kinds of anti-Semitic uh, attacks in the, in, in the, on the, webs, in the web and the internet. But, so, but, but why, why dwell on the negative? You know, let's, let's, let's keep it positive. Uh, <laughs> So I want to talk about uh, something more affirmative. Or this, this, say Leo Strauss is a Jewish thinker. What, did, what does that mean? Uh, certainly, that Strauss's work is never uh, wanted for critics. But until very recently, most of the critics of Strauss have been largely confined in the in the tight uh, little world of, of academia. But as a great uh, political philosopher Dinah Washington once said, uh, you know, what a difference a day makes. Uh, the past couple of years, the work and influence of Strauss has been debated and discussed in every leading newspaper, magazine, and journal in the country, abroad. And what has made the headlines has been not his arcane, often arcane interpretations of Plato or Maimonides, in short, but rather his influence on, on the political movement known as neoconservatism. Strauss's influence is felt today from beyond the grave. A wide range of Washington policy analysts, journalists, opinion makers of all sorts. Among those most frequently mentioned in this respect is disciples in some way, our former defense secretary, Paul Wolfowitz, and editor of the Weekly Standard magazine, Bill Crystal. And as if this were not enough, Strauss's name has even been mentioned in broad on Broadway. In a play of a couple of years ago, put on by Academy Award-winning actor and anti-war activist Tim Robbins, in a play called Embedded, dealing with the Iraq War, in which uh, the war is presented as created by a sinister cabal that periodically throughout the play shouts out to the audience, Hail to Leo Strauss. <laughs> Who would have thought that, you know? <laughs> However, uh, 
It is not for his contributions to this, whether real or apocryphal, to neoconservatism that I, I really want to talk about today. But I want to speak about Strauss as a Jewish philosopher, as a Jewish thinker. His contribution, in many ways, to Jewish thought would appear at first uncontroversial. His first book, I mentioned something about it in a moment, was called Spinoza's Critique of Religion. It was written while he was a member of a prestigious academy for Jewish studies in Berlin in the 1920s. The second book, written in 1935, was called Philosophy and Law. It was an examination of Maimonides, some of the most important Greek and Islamic predecessors. And throughout his long career, a large number of essays famously centering on the theme of what he called Jerusalem and Athens. Uh, developed Strauss's lifelong fascination with the differences between biblical thought and Greek philosophy. And finally, uh, in an autobiographical essay written rather late in his life, Strauss spoke in no uncertain terms about the various currents of Jewish orthodoxy, Zionism, and political liberalism with, within which he came to maturity. Of course, to describe anybody as a Jewish thinker means, I suppose, more than to say, this is more than simply a fact or a, a biographical fact of birth and ancestry. It, it presupposes there is some meaningful sense in which one can speak about Jewish thought that distinguishes it from other kinds of thought. And in the face of it, that might not be so easy to identify. I mean, what, what, for example, is the thought of thinkers like Rashi, Judah Halevi, and Maimonides have in common with such quintessentially modern Jewish thinkers as Spinoza, Heine, Marx, Freud, whoever? What, what can these names possibly mean except just to provide a sort of list Jewish thinkers no different from the kinds of lists one finds in books and magazines that gives a, give us name of famous Jewish celebrities and sports figures. So then some people say, oh, do you know, you know that Sean Green is Jewish? A famous baseball player. Anyway, it gets us no closer to the issue itself. So, before probing the issue, let me say a word, for those of you from whom the Leo Strauss may be not so familiar, let me say a word of biography. Strauss was born in a small Hessian village of Kirshan in 1899. On his own account, he was brought up in an observant household where he remarked later that the Jewish laws were rather strictly observed. And after graduating from a local gymnasium or high school. In a brief service in World War I, Strauss attended the University of Marburg, not far from his home. It was then the center of neo-Kantian philosophy of the period, inspired by a man named Hermann Cohen. Strauss received his doctorate in 1921 from the University of Hamburg where he wrote a dissertation under a man named Kassira, who interestingly taught at Yale many, many years later after World War II. In a year, he, he spent a year, a postgraduate year, at Freiburg University, where he originally went to study with the philosopher Edmund Husserl. But it was during this year that he actually met and was uh, riveted by a young professor who was Husserl's research assistant by the name of Heidegger, who left a deep and even lifelong impression on Strauss. Uh, throughout the 1920s, Strauss worked as a research assistant at an academy for Jewish studies, which was called the Wissenschaft des Judentums in Berlin, where he worked from 1925 to 1932 where his principal task was editing, or co-editing, the Academy's Jubilee edition of the works of Moses Mendelssohn. Uh, 
uh, something he worked on with a man named Alexander Altman, who later came to America, taught at Brandeis, who wrote a monumental biography of Mendelssohn. And it was during this, these years of the late 1920s that Strauss published some of his earliest essays and reviews on Zionism and other Jewish themes, first in, in a journal edited by Martin Buber called Der Jude, and in other journals such as the Jude Shabonshaw. His first book, which I've already alluded to in English, titled Spinoza's Critique of the Lips, Religion, was published in 1930 and dedicated to the memory of Franz Rosenzweig, who had died the year before the book's publication, and with whom Strauss was close. Strauss left Germany in 1932 under the auspices of a Rockefeller grant, who spent a year first in Paris, uh, studying mainly and working mainly on uh, medieval Jewish and Islamic thought, and a year later moved to England where he spent four years before emigrating to the United States in 1938. Uh, he took up a position, was offered a position, first a temporary position, which quickly turned into a full-time position, which led to a full professorship, at the New School for Social Research in New York, which was then uh, a haven for European academics in exile from, from Germany and other European and Strauss spent a decade at the New School in an extraordinary constellation of European scholars from areas in philosophy, politics, sociology, psychology. This was a remarkable, productive, remarkably productive and fruitful period of his life, which we are just in some ways now learning to appreciate. I think and it was, in fact, it was during these this decade spent at the New School, but in a way Strauss first became a Straussian. I won't go into exactly what that means and how, how his distinctive style and set of thought developed in this period. In 1949, he accepted a position at the University of Chicago, a major position, at a, obviously at an important university, where he spent the next 20 years and where he really did most of his work that is now probably most uh, famously associated with his name. Uh, many books began to pour out from his pen. A book called Persecution of the Art of Writing, published in 1952. Probably his most famous book called Natural Right and History, published in 1953. Uh, very controversial book. Everything Strauss wrote was controversial, but uh, especially controversial book called Thoughts on Machiavelli came out in 1958. This is actually marks the 50th year, 50th anniversary of the book's publication. What is Political Philosophy, 1959, and, and, and many others throughout the 60s. It was during this period, particularly in the 50s, that Strauss came to exercise his greatest influence and began to attract a remarkable cadre of students, uh, probably the most famous being today the Members Alan Bloom, but, but, uh, many, many others, Stanley Rosen, Seth Benardetti, uh, many, many others. In the year 1954, Strauss accepted an invitation by Gershon Scholem, a uh, German Jewish philosopher of uh, Jewish mysticism, accepted an invitation to come to the Hebrew University. Strauss spent a year in Jerusalem. Uh, which I've written about and I'm going to right now. It out to be a very important year for him. But, but except for that year, uh, spent more or less the rest of his life being devoted exclusively to teaching and writing. Uh, his later works uh, increasingly focused on ancient classical Greek political philosophy, Plato, Xenophon, Thucydides, and so on. And on his retirement from the University of Chicago in 1967, he accepted a position, uh, an invitation by an old friend of his named Jacob Klein, an old friend of his from Germany. Klein had been teaching for many years at St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. And Strauss, at the invitation of Klein, uh, moved uh, to St. John's where 
he spent his last years up until his death in 1973. Since then, uh, particularly in the last few years, several volumes of previously uncollected essays and lectures of his have been published, a sizable and uh, philosophical correspondence, which is, is being gathered and collected and then published now. And his work, always controversial uh, during his lifetime, continues, as I said, to generate debate, continued debate, uh, even today, probably in some respects even more now than while he was alive. So what, what was Strauss's contribution? Uh, that, uh, what, what was his contribution to Jewish thought? The core theme or the core problem to which he alluded again and again throughout his writings, he called metaphorically, uh, you might say, the problem of Jerusalem and Athens. Let's, let's think uh, about what, what do those two, two names signify for him. Je Jerusalem and Athens meant for him the city of faith and the city of philosophy. These were for him the two polarities around which the Western tradition has revolved. The spirit of Athens has traditionally been understood as the embodiment of rationality, democracy, of science in, in the broadest sense of that term. The spirit of Jerusalem represents the embodiment of love, of faith, of morality, again, in the broadest sense of that term. For many thinkers, the name of and of Hermann Cohen comes to mind. Modernity, he claimed, is itself predicated upon a synthesis of Jerusalem and Athens, of ethics and science. Modernity and progress is, are only possible with the synthesis of these two great currents of thought. But the question Strauss asks is, are these compatible? Is such a synthesis possible? In many ways, he is responsible for reclaiming Tertullian's ancient question. What has Athens to do with Jews? On the surface, it would seem that Athens, Jerusalem and Athens represent two fundamentally and even antagonistic codes or ways of life. Consider just the following. Greek philosophy elevates reason. Our own human reason is the one thing needful for life. Greek philosophy culminates in the person of Socrates, who famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Only the life given over to the cultivation of autonomous human understanding is a worthy way of living for a human being. But the Bible presents itself, on the other hand, not as a philosophy, but as a code of law an unchangeable divine law mandating how we should live. In fact, the first five books of the Bible, known in the Jewish tradition as Torah, are perhaps, is perhaps most literally translated simply as the law. The attitude taught by the Bible is not one of critical self-reflection or examination, but rather of obedience, of faith, and of trust in God. And if the paradigmatic Athenian is Socrates, you might say the paradigmatic biblical figure, hero, is Abraham, who is prepared to sacrifice his own son for an unintelligible command. The difference, then, between Athens and Jerusalem then seems to be more than a conflict between age -old the age-old antagonists of faith and reason. These two alternatives express fundamentally different moral and political points of view. Again, consider the following. The pinnacle of Greek eth ethical thought is a book called Aristotle by Aristotle called The Ethics. And the pinnacle of his ethics is a virtue he called greatness of soul, or in Greek, megalopsuchia. Greatness of soul, as that name implies, is the virtue concerned with honor. A great-souled man is said to claim much because he believes he deserves much. Such a person is concerned above all with how he is seen by others 
and of course to be worthy of the recognition that is bestowed on him by his great acts of public service. Aristotle describes this man as haughty in the extreme. But contrast this, if you will, to the heroes extolled by the Bible. Such men are typically deeply aware of their own imperfections, their own unworthiness before God, and are haunted by a deep sense of guilt and insufficiency. Recall the following words of Isaiah. I am a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. Is it even conceivable to think of a Greek philosopher uttering these words? But more to the point, which of these two is more admirable? Aristotelian man's sense of self-worth and pride in his own accomplishments, or biblical man's sense of his own unworthiness and dependence on divine love? And these differences go deeper still. The god of the philosophers is Aristotle's famous unmoved mover, described in his physics. The unmoved mover is something like pure thought, which is why Plato and Aristotle believe the act of solitary contemplation is what brought us closer to the divine, what they call theoria, or pure reflection, is the activity the Greeks believe to be most godlike. Needless to say, the Aristotelian unmoved mover, unlike the God of the Bible, is not something particularly concerned with human beings and their fate. The God of Abraham, the God of Aristotle, whatever else one might want to say, is not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That God, the God of the Bible, is by contrast said to have created us in his image. This means that it is not contemplation or philosophy but rather repentance and a ruthless demand for purity of heart that is required of us. Repentance, or in the Hebrew, teshuva, means to return, a kind of return to an earlier state of purity and simplicity. The omnipotent God of the Bible is not a thinking substance, but is rather presented as a being who dwells in the thick darkness and whose ways are not our ways. So the question remained for Strauss as he presented it. Given these alternatives, how is one to choose? How, how do we know which one is correct? Uh, each side, Athens or Jerusalem, stakes a claim on our allegiance. But each side also seems to exclude the other. So what, what are we to do? One answer, maybe the most obvious answer, would be to say we are open to both. We're willing to listen, to listen first, and then to judge and decide. But to say that we will make a choice on the basis of our own best judgment seems already to decide the matter in favor of reason, of philosophy, of ethics, over and against faith. Yet on the other hand, you might say that any question, any answer to the question, who is right on this question, Jerusalem or Athens? It's based on an act of faith. We just have to pick sides somehow, choose, decision, decisionism, make a choice, jump in. But in that case, the side of Jerusalem seems to have triumphed over Athens. A philosophy that is based on faith, or is based on some kind of leap of faith, can no longer be a real philosophy. This is the problem as Strauss, as Strauss presented it problem presented, not just to philosophy, but to Jewish thought. How do we choose between them and what to do? He, he seems to leave us with a dilemma. So rather than try to answer that, either in my own name or in his, I'm going to kind of move to a slightly different, I'm going to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too difficult for me, frankly. Um, I'm going to show how we got to that point, how we got to that point. How did he come to think about this? This, in a way, very abstract issue, although in some ways not so abstract, very concrete, the abstract issue of Jerusalem and Athens was for Strauss a very real historical and political problem. 
in the most immediate and urgent expression of that problem was what was called uh, the Jewish question. The Jewish question. The Jewish question was meant to describe, but was not confined, the predicament of German Jewry of his time. It was in Germany where the fate of modern Jewry was most intensely debated, and which Strauss would sometimes say was the major theme of his investigations. Strauss saw the Jewish question as first and foremost a political question, or to use a term that he cribbed from the philosopher Spinoza, it was first and foremost a theological, political question or problem. That problem turned on what form or what shape Judaism would take in the world of the modern liberal state. German Jews, perhaps more than Jews of any other nation, maybe the Americans' rival in this respect, were wedded to the fate of modern liberalism. This result, as Strauss analyzed it, was a mixed blessing. The triumph of liberal democracy certainly brought civil equality, toleration, the end of the worst forms of persecution, even if not all forms of private discrimination. And yet at the same time, liberalism seemed to have required of Judaism, as in fact it does of all faiths, that it undergo a kind of privatization of belief. That is to say, the transformation of Jewish law from a communal authority to the precincts of individual or private conscience. Arguably, you could say this makes harsher demands on Judaism than on other religions, because Judaism understands itself, in the first instance, not as a faith or as a body of beliefs, but rather as a body of law intended to regulate the life of a political community. The liberal principle, by contrast with the separation of state and society, of public and private belief, would seem to result in the inevitable, what we could call Protestantization of Judaism. This is the way Strauss saw, it, saw the problem in the, in the 1920s in Germany. The Germany of Strauss's early adulthood was the Germany of the famous Weimar Republic. Weimar was a liberal democracy created in the wake of Germany's defeat in the First World War. And Weimar was regarded by many intellectuals of Strauss's generation as in many ways a foreign import without roots in the German tradition. It was regarded as a symbol of Anglo-French domination that it could trace its roots back to the French Revolution. This weakness of liberalism in Germany, to some degree, accounts for the inability of the Weimar Republic to protect its most vulnerable minority, its Jewish citizens. And it is no coincidence that the attack upon Weimar was an attack upon German Jewry. The Weimar Republic, Strauss would later remark, was succeeded by the only German regime, in fact, he says, the only regime anywhere which had no other clear principle except murderous hatred of the Jews. It was, in other words, the weakness and fragility of liberal democracy, especially in Germany, its susceptibility to demagoguery that would become a central part of Strauss's later work. What then to do about it? Strauss's answer to that question was, of course, to tell a story, a very long story of modernity. The dilemma of German Jewry had a long history that Strauss traced back to a man named Spinoza in the 17th century. Spinoza was in many ways the godfather of modern Jewry. In just the way Marlon Brando presented it in the book. He made <laughs> the Jews an offer he thought they could not refuse. Actually, I'm going to suggest two offers. The first of those offers was the promise of emancipation. Emancipation from ghetto life, followed by assimilation into modern democrats, a kind of modern secular democratic society. Liberal democracy, as Spinoza envisaged it, is a society constituted by a kind of universal rational morality. And as such, 
it would be a society that would be neither Christian nor, nor Jewish, but in fact neutral with regard to the competing denominations. A new society that was theologically neutral. It would be a society where individuals would be encouraged to shed their former religious identities and become, as it were, citizens of the, mod of the new modern state, the new modern world. Again, to the extent that religion existed, it would really remain a matter of private belief and private, it would no longer have any public or political status. A solution to which, you know, we, we are all familiar, which in many ways looks kind of like America in some, in some respects. But Strauss asked the question, what if democracy does not solve the Jewish question? In fact, democracies, he tells us, stand or fall on the distinction between the public and the private sphere. Demo democratic governments on this account may be unable to discriminate between individuals on the basis of religion, or I might also add on the basis of gender or racial lines. But that does not stop individuals and other groups, private groups, from continuing to discriminate. In fact, rather than solving the problem of persecution, rather than solving the Jewish question, we might say, democracy seems simply to move it from the public to the private side of the ledger. Uh, it seems a solution, but not, not exactly a, an answer, a complete answer to, the, to this question. And so this is where Spinoza, or Strauss following Spinoza, offered a second option to the German Jewry of his, German Jews of his generation. Not the liberal state, not, not emancipation within a democratic state, but Zionism. A Jewish state. Spinoza's book, famous book, Theological Political Tractat, actually holds this out as a possibility. The possibility of a reconstituted Jewish state. To be sure, Spinoza's call for the restitution of Jewish sovereignty is extremely ambiguous. Such a state, as Spinoza conceived it at least, need not be located in the historical land of Israel, could just as easily have been located in Canada, Kathmandu. Nor does Spinoza indicate whether such a state would need to be a democracy, and if so, what the status of Judaism would be within it. Nevertheless, and to return to our subject, main subject, Strauss assigned to Spinoza an honored role among the founders of political Zionism. It was to this creed, to political Zionism, that he professed a kind of allegiance throughout his career. In one of his autobiographical remarks, he said he was converted to Zionism at the age of 17. And uh, remains so. And he praised Zionism for its effort to restore a sense of Jewish pride and self-respect in an era of assimilation and a loss of traditional values. He regarded Zionism in some, but by, by no means all respects, as a conservative movement seeking to validate Jewish traditions and loyalties. He once compared the Zionist pioneers in the land of Palestine to the American Pilgrim Fathers, forming what he called a kind of natural aristocracy. <coughs> Actually, I'll just mention, he, he uses that expression in one of his very, very few public Letter is, is particularly appropriate today. A letter to the National Review, founded by William Buckley, William Buckley who just passed away yesterday. In 1956, shortly after returning from this year in Israel, that I referred to, Strauss sent it, and I would describe it as an angry letter to the National Review, which at that time, not today to be sure, but at that time, was, was very anti Israel. And Strauss complained about what he called the anti-Jewish animus of the magazine, and went on in a brilliant, uh, sort of probably deliberately rhetorical way to describe, you might say, the socialist Zionist pioneers who founded Israel as conservatives that the uh, readers and editors of the National Review should appreciate. It's a very clever, cleverly uh, crafted letter. But Strauss's relation, this is Strauss's relation to Zionism is a long story, which has not yet been fully told. But for complicated reasons, 
he came to see the problem with political Zionism as its failure to think through the problems of the modern democratic state. Early Zionist thinkers like Theodor Herzl or Lev Pinsky regarded the solution to the Jewish problem simply as the creation of a Jewish state, and this would put an end to discrimination, providing full civic equality for the Jews. It would, in effect, just be a European state, but created by and for Jews. And the Achilles heel of that solution, Strauss believed, is that any such state, as it was conceived by them, lacked an, an intrinsic connection to the moral and spiritual world of Judaism that it was trying to save. A, state, a Jewish state without a Jewish culture would be, in his words, simply an empty shell. It would lack something vital to its support. And for exactly this reason, or for that reason, Strauss expressed a marked appreciation for the movement known as cultural science founded by people like Ahmed Am, who argued precisely that a Jewish state, to be viable, would need to be rooted in a vibrant Jewish culture. The political Zionism, with its emphasis on states and political institutions, was in many ways the product of the thinking of the European Enlightenment. Cultural Zionism, with its emphasis on cultivating a distinctive Jewish arts and letters, language and literature, was a product of European Romanticism. The problem with cultural Zionism, although well, Strauss was an appreciator of it, was revealed in an amusing anecdote that I can't, that he told, that I can't refrain from repeating. A story that he told about himself in the 1920s when he had a meeting and he met, very impressed with, the founder of a man named Jabotinsky, the founder of what's called the Revisionist Movement, the Zionist Movement, a precursor to Likud, a kind of conservative militant wing of Zionism. And Strauss said he met, met Jabotinsky in Berlin when he was a young man. And in this capacity, Jabotinsky said to him, Oh, what, what are you doing? What, 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 are, what are you doing? And Strauss said, well, we, we read the Bible, we study Jewish history, we, we discuss Zionist theory, we keep abreast of events in Palestine, and so on. And Jabotinsky said to him, in rifle practice? <laughs> and Strauss said, no. <laughs> but Jabotinsky had a point that made a very deep impression on him, that a, that a state cannot subsist on culture alone. It requires armies, police force, young men and women with uniforms and guns who are willing to protect it. So the cultural Zionists do not have a full answer to that question. You cannot build a society around Israeli folk music and folk dancing, you know, is the admirable. And this, so this led Strauss to consider a third option, what was called religious Zionism. Religious Zionism. In fact, he came to see that cultural Zionism misunderstood his belief, the Jewish experience. It understands Judaism as the product of the, of the Jewish mind, of the, of the folk mind. It is, again, based in this kind of romantic idea coming from the German romanticism of individual uh, folk minds that, are, are, that, that, that constitute a people. But Strauss says to take Judaism seriously, one needs to take seriously revelation. The Jewish culture is an outgrowth or a product of revelation, not, not the other way around. And it's only when we consider this foundation in revelation that cultural Zionism, you might say, morphs into religious Zionism. Strauss was not a religious Zionist, and I think it is important to remember that he never for a moment confounded politics with redemption. Uh, in a very enigmatic passage from a lecture that he gave late in life called Why We Remain Jews, he argues that the Jewish people have been chosen to prove the absence of redemption. That redemption is not possible, at least in this world. The creation of the Jewish state, he said, may be the most important fact 
in Jewish history since the completion of the Talmud, but it should not be confused with the coming of a messianic era and the redemption of all people. So what is the function of the Jewish state? If it is not to be understood purely as a secular democratic state, what is its purpose? In the final analysis, Strauss was grateful said eternally grateful for the Jewish state, which he called a blessing for all Jews everywhere, whether or not they admitted it to themselves. But not even the Jewish state, he said, could be regarded as a solution to the Jewish question. And I, think, I think this is, in many ways, his most provocative statement. The establishment of the state of Israel, he wrote uh, in, a, in, a, in an autobiographical the establishment of the state of Israel is the most profound modification of the exile which has occurred. But it is not the end of the exile, he said. In the religious sense, and perhaps only in the religious sense, the state of Israel is a part of the exile. What, what could he have meant by that, that the Jewish state still remains a part of the exile and has therefore not solved the Jewish question? Passages like that or maybe I should say, I shouldn't say passages like that, because I think that statement I just read is fairly unique in Strauss's writings. Call to mind, at least to my mind, Franz Rosenzweig, whose name I mentioned, and whose name Strauss said will always be remembered when informed people speak about existentialism. He wrote that in 1962, and there was a lot of talk about existentialism. But of course, no talk about Franz Rosenstein. So, ergo, I draw your own conclusion about what you thought about the people about existentialism. <laughs> For Rosenstein, the Jewish question was something that ultimately stood outside of politics and history. Judaism was a repository of certain revealed trans historical truths that could not be reduced to politics or to culture. Like Hermann Cohen, Rosenzweig was also a passionate anti-Zionist. The Jewish calling Rosenzweig believed, remember he's writing this in the 1920s, the Jewish calling was to remain a people of prayer and study and to resist the trapments of political power. It is the destiny, so Rosenzweig believed, of the Jewish people to live in a way in the world but to remain a part of it as a unique covenantal community. In many ways, you could say Strauss's claim to stand apart from, to some degree even above, Jerusalem and Athens, and to remain an attentive interpreter of each to the other was an echo, a distant echo, but an echo to be sure of Rosenzweig's argument that, mod that the modern Jew remains perpetually torn between two homelands, faith and reason, between thought and philosophy, between what they call Deutschtum and Judentum, Germany and Judaism. In many ways, Rosenzweig's establishment of, the, of, or of an association of schools called the Free Jewish House of Learning in Frankfurt, which was devoted to the study and transmission, translation of Jewish texts, could very well have served as a model for Strauss's creation of an interpretive community at the University of Chicago many years later. Chicago remained the kind of Yiddish warehouse of exile, you might say. It's a thought. <laughs> How am I doing? Can I keep, should I keep going? I don't go for too much longer. I mean, where, where is this going? Where am I going? I have to question. <laughs> Wrap it up. Strauss considered, you might say, that I'm just given, just touch very briefly on the big currents of modern Jewish thought, Hermann Kohanian, Neo Kantianism, Zionism, what was Rosenstein, what he called the New Thinking. Existent, Jewish existentialism. And it was from a kind of confrontation with, with these currents of modern thought that Strauss considered anew 
the possibility of a return to what he called orthodoxy. A return to orthodoxy, a term that he used, I would say, in a unique and to some degree idiosyncratic sense. What did he mean? By a return to orthodoxy, he meant a return to medieval rationalism, particularly the rationalism associated with Maimonides. What did that mean? I'll just try to set it out in a couple of propositions. Strauss's rediscovery of medieval rationalism, Maimonidean rationalism, meant returning to the traditional or to at least the pre-modern meaning of revelation. Works like Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed, as, as Strauss read them, were not philosophical books in the manner of Spinoza's Ethics or even Rosenzweig's Star of Redemption. These were Jewish books. They were Jewish books insofar as they accepted the primacy of revelation as their absolute point of departure. The primacy of revelation was connected by Strauss, or was even identified with Strauss, to the primacy of politics. The prophet, in the original meaning of the term, as Strauss understands it, is a lawgiver. And prophecy, or what he sometimes calls prophetology, is the science of the law. The prophet is the creator of the moral and political community within which philosophy is even possible. It follows that the revelation belongs to the study of political science, something that would no doubt perplex many of my colleagues. <laughs> so at least two consequences follow from, from that discovery. The first is his assertion of the fundamental difference between revelation and philosophy. This put him deeply at odds, just kind of repeating what I've said, with those interpreters who stress the unity, or at least the compatibility, of faith and reason. The unity of faith and reason was always evidence for him of a kind of Thomistic tendency that holds true for medieval Catholicism, but not for the Judeo-Arabic writers with whom he was most familiar. And the second consequence of Strauss's return to Maimonideanism would seem to be, at least on the surface, a purely kind of literary problem. This concerns the complex and often ambiguous manner of writing in which certain ancient and medieval writers chose to reveal, or in fact to conceal, their deepest and most important teachings from public scrutiny. <coughs> this doctrine of esotericism, or the double truth, had certainly been noted by Strauss's scholarly predecessors, but none had accorded it the centrality that Strauss attributed to it, unlike the modern Enlightenment that set itself the task of removing prejudices and undermining foundations, a kind of race to the abyss, Strauss found in medieval, the medieval enlightenment a different mode of philosophy, one that sets out not to destroy society, but to maintain religion's political role while obliquely indicating that which favors philosophy. Strauss regarded this recovery of the esoteric tradition Judaism, not only as an historical or a philological discovery, but as a key, a key moment to the meaning of orthodoxy. By orthodoxy, again, he did not mean by this the black hat Haredi community that occupies neighborhoods like Crown Heights or Borough Park, nor does orthodoxy refer to the, you know, the settlers, the residents of Mea Sharim in <coughs> Jerusalem, but rather to a Maimonidean strategy that professes a kind of outward fidelity to the law and to the community of Israel, with an inward or private commitment to philosophy and the life of free inquiry. This dual strategy allows one to remain respect for, even love of the tradition, as a kind of prophylactic to the alternatives of atheism and assimilation. The doctrine of the double truth remains the only way of preserving the viability of Judaism in a post-Nietzschean world that demands intellectual probity at all costs. It is almost impossible not to read Strauss's understanding of orthodoxy as intended to apply to the situation of contemporary Jewry. 
to be sure, fundamental differences exist between the 12th and the 20th, 20th centuries theological political predicament. And to state only the most obvious, we no longer occupy a world like Maimonides where the primacy of revelation or the immortality of the soul are taken for granted. For this very reason, it has been a source of deep consternation for many readers of Strauss that he decided to imitate Maimonides by adopting similar modes of expression and practicing the same reticence and deliberate caution in an altogether different world. Why did he do that? What purpose could this oblique and obscure mode of writing have in the modern disenchanted world? Strauss's defense of orthodoxy, or Strauss's defense makes orthodoxy out to be little more than a, a platonic noble lie. A, a heroic delusion, as he once called it, which seems again to violate the one cardinal rule we expect from philosophers, intellectual honesty. People who live in glass houses should not throw stones. And Strauss, who took such evident glee in exposing others, cannot in good conscience complain when the same trick is played on him. To Strauss's defense of orthodoxy escape the problems that he so ably diagnosed in others? Does his attempt to turn orthodoxy into a legal fiction fulfill the basic hermeneutic, of, the basic requirement of his hermeneutic method, namely to understand the thought of the past as it understood itself? Or does he in fact impart a kind of crypto-maimonideanism even into the very core of orthodoxy? We can only wish that Leo Strauss were here today to help us answer some of these questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I hope they didn't go on too long, but we have to take any questions. Um, in preparation for the talk today, I looked at your book, uh, Leaving Leo Strauss, and the first thing Especially in the first part when you, the first half when you talk about Neil Strauss as a Jewish thinker, that um, it would be it would be important to know what kind of Jewish person he was, what kind of Jewish life he led. Um, in the latter part of the book, I remember, um, I think it was in a letter to Alexander Kozhev, where he talks about enjoying the ham. And the <laughs> and I forget the exact word. Right, yeah. um, you know, so, what kind of what what kind of life Jewish life did he lead? That's a that's certainly a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. uh, and wouldn't that be important to determine in what sense he's a Jewish thinker? It might be. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to. I, I don't think we should. You know, it's it's hard to know exactly how much to read into bio, how much biography determines thought. But uh, that's a, that's an that's an important question. Uh, Strauss describes himself, I think I quoted him as being raised in what he describes an Orthodox family where the Jewish law was very really strictly observed. Strauss, unlike, I'll just, just as a little sidebar to this, unlike many of Strauss's contemporary, uh, the contemporaries that were names that are familiar, Hannah Arendt or Theodore Adorno, even Gershon Scholler, who came from Berlin or I think Leipzig, you know, intellectual, cultural, urban centers of enlightened thinking. Uh, Strauss came from a big town, a small town in Hesse, a village, a rural village. Uh, and parents were well-to-do in, in, in the town. In one story he tells, as a young as a boy, he said he remembered, uh, I guess he must, you know, you know or 12, he tells a story of seeing a group of Russian Jews coming through the town. They were had been expelled by a pogrom. This is on their way to Australia. And he said he was struck by that he was shocked by this because he was under the belief such a thing could not happen here. He said that we lived in a condition of profound peace with our non-Jewish neighbors. Such a thing could not happen. But then he said also, well, but the thought began, once Once you see, once you have the thought, it begins to occur to you that maybe it could happen. But just, just that, I mean, so he, he grew up in a, in, a, in a 
the observant family. He, he was not observant. Uh, Strauss is, a, is an adult. Is an, is an adult. Is, is, he, he wrote widely on Jewish things, but he, he was not an observant Jew. There, there is that funny letter that you allude to that he writes he's from England when he had just moved to England. He's, he's about 31 or 2 years old at this point. He's living in he writes a letter to a friend of his in Paris saying he just he, he loves the English breakfasts. He loves the English breakfasts. He says, the hams and bacons, he says, uh, how do you put it? Uh, the, 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 the bacons are such that uh, they must be permitted. They are so delicious that they must be permitted by the atheistic interpretation of the Mosaic Law. <laughs> 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 but he, he was he was not observant. But however, having said that, and I've I've written for a book I'm editing a a, a, bi a biographical essay on Strauss. And I, in, in the course of it, I interviewed a number of people, uh, the students who knew him from the fifties when he was sort of uh, at the University of Chicago, early years when he was in Chicago. And all of them said, you know, Strauss, Strauss is a regular at the, at the Chicago Bilal House. We'd, all, we'd always give a talk there. And, and, you know, even the University of Chicago, even, even though we think of the Ivy League, the University of Chicago has been much more open to Jewish students and faculty members at that time. You'd say the Ivy League was in the same period. Still, there was deep uh, Resistance in some ways, and, and, all, and a number of people said to me, I'm, I'm in, completely independently of one another, that Strauss uh, made, brought to them his, his students. He, he gave them a kind of Jewish pride that Judaism was not just something of the legacy of their, their 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 first generation, you know, European parents. It was just not a a part of some childish superstition. He gave them a pride and, and, and showed an intellectual, not just a kind of moral pride, but he had a kind of intellect, showed an intellectual integrity in, in Jewish thought. And in fact, many of Strauss's students have gone on to produce uh, very, very uh, important books on biblical themes, on themes of Jewish, Jewish uh, thought, Jewish and Islamic thought, to what should add. Uh, so no, he was not a, he was not an observant he was not an observant Jew. And you can you can make of that what you will. You can call him I can call him hypocrite if you like. I don't know. It's not fine with me. <laughs> but uh, he was not observant. But Strauss, I think, felt something very deeply. This this is very deeply important to him. And one of the things I've tried to do in my book, to some degree, and I'm glad you pointed to that those chapters is I've, I've tried to bring out uh, the depth of Strauss's Jewish Jewish concerns and Jewish interests. Uh, it's easy to overlook those because he wrote about so many other things as well. I've, I've sort of made this central in this talk, but uh, this was only in some ways a small <coughs> part of what Strauss's life's work was devoted to. Uh, although its size shouldn't be uh, mistaken, I think it's small, relatively small size for the importance that he gave to it. What is that? When you say when you say he was not observing the Jewish, right? He lived like that, uh, like uh, Shabbat, for instance. Yes, he was not a synagogue goer. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, at the debate between Kassir and Heidegger, mm -hmm. 1929. I would imagine Strauss had any friends attending. Did he, did he attend also? Did he have I, contact? You know, I believe so. I believe he was. He never, he never wrote about that. He, he never wrote about that famous Davos debate. He, he tells the story. He was in Freiburg that one year in 1922, that brief that postdoctoral year, I guess it was 21, 22, when he first met Heidegger and to some degree formed lifelong friendships with many of the, the students who were part of the, the broader Heidegger circle at that time. Um, and he tells the story, he told it on a couple of occasions, so it must have been something very important to him. He said uh, uh, Heidegger so moved him, uh, so found his 
and you know what what he found. Uh, Heidegger was lecturing on Aristotle. On Aristotle, he found his Aristotle lectures uh, riveting. He hadn't seen anybody before take a text and submit it to the kind of close analysis and so on that, that Heidegger did. Apparently. He says on his way back to Berlin. He, he said he stopped off in Frankfurt to visit Franz Rosenzweig, his early mentor. And he said to and he said to Rosenzweig, he says that compared to Heidegger, he said Max Weber and the other kind of heroes of his youth, Cohen and Weber, he says they they became like began to seem like orphan children, just cut loose somehow, just kind of rootless. Heidegger, something about that, the experience of Heidegger. And I, I have an argument in my book and, and, um, that in many ways Strauss's life's work was in many ways an ongoing discussion and an, an attempt to rebuke, to re refute Heidegger. It was certainly an ongoing confrontation with Heidegger. Uh, this, this, I think, made an enormous influence on him. And of course, uh, the years that you alluded to are long before Heidegger was associated with Nazism. This is, this is, but in Strauss, Strauss was very blunt about this later on. He said that uh, he said that uh, he always made the fact that there was something about Heidegger's philosophy. I'm not sure he ever fully, to my satisfaction, worked out what that something was. But there was something in it that led Heidegger uh, to to the Nazi movement. <clears throat> and that for him showed that there was must be something deeply flawed with Heidegger and Strauss. And Strauss's work was a kind of rebuttal of it. But as much to his credit, I think that you know Heidegger made the deepest impression on him. You can say about Heidegger he was the only philosopher. Things like the only philosopher of the 20th century. Statements like that, which obviously show the enormous. Reservoir of, of admiration for this, for this man, as horrible as he was. He did not, unlike Hannah Arendt, he didn't attempt to paper over Heidegger's bad judgment and his the evil that he was associated with. So, so someone that was that was that was uh, in some ways almost a necessary consequence or byproduct of his philosophy. Are, are you saying that that after Heidegger? Identified with the Nazis. Mm -hmm. At that point, Strauss realized there was something wrong. Or going back before. No, two. I think I, you know it's, it's a little, the, 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 the genealogy of it's a little a little hard to tell. I think it wasn't clear before. I, I'm talking about after, long afterwards, when he writes his famous book at the University of Chicago. I'm reading now in my seminar called Natural Writing History. Heidegger's never mentioned by name. No, his name is never mentioned. But it's evident, evident on almost every page of the book that Heidegger is the person. I mean, even the title of the book, Heidegger's famous book, Being in Time, and Strauss calls his book Natural Writing History. It's an answer to the other. You can see that Heidegger is, is the guy he's trying to refute, while at the same time wishing not to call attention to him. Heidegger wasn't known in, in the 50s. No, no one knew Heidegger in America. You know, his work hadn't been translated. He didn't want to call attention to him. Sorry? Please. I think uh, Levinas uh, report the discussion between Kasper mm -hmm. and Heidegger because he was a student of yours. And he was, they make a uh, kind of play. And Levinas was, I think, to understand the split of Heidegger, to come back to De uh, Davos. Uh, Levinas say that it was the opposition between irrationalism, irrationalism, that my German irrationalism, and Enlightenment thought. Kazura was like the last defender of the Enlightenment. Exactly. And exactly. so, if we come back to this opposition between Aten and Yerushalayim, uh, we can converse. The change in Nietzsche perspective is not anymore Jerusalem versus Athens, but Jerusalem versus Rome. 
and that in Davos, that was the the center. Now I would like to ask one question, if it's possible. The relation between um, Strauss and Spinoza. Levinas thought that Spinoza is the first one who killed God and is a disciple or a godfather of Nietzsche. In what way would you, you can consider Spinoza like a Jewish thinker or like a part of Jewish uh, thing but is hermeneutic is not uh, accepted like uh, from the Levinas' point of view. Is hermeneutic is anti? Right. Well, you know, Levinas first wrote that famous essay uh, attacking Spinoza. Two, Two essays. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Give me the reference. I know one, but uh, the one that's in the Difficult Freedom volume, uh, the case of Spinoza. But yeah, he, in, Levinas in many ways repeats Hermann Cohen's attack on Spinoza as being a betrayer of Judaism, and as having, uh, as, yes, as, as, as being a traitor, as being a traitor to the Jews. Uh, so Strauss, Strauss addresses this issue. I'm not sure if Strauss ever knew of Levinas. I know they didn't know each other. I'm not sure he, he knew of him. Uh, but Strauss addresses that, that critique in some of his writings and will say things like um, Co uh, Spinoza was the greatest man of, of Jewish origin who you know, refused to accept the truth of Judaism or some, something to that effect. Strauss also, I don't, I don't think as violently as Levinas or Cohen sort of writes, wants to write Spinoza out of the Jewish canon. But yet there's something also in Strauss. He, Strauss also sees Spinoza, as I was talking about earlier, as, as a kind of precursor of Zionism, too. There was something in Spinoza, too, that wants to maintain, uh, sees the importance of, of maintaining a, if you want to call it, Jewish identity or Jewish tradition and, and, and the possibility of a Jewish state. Uh, Cohen was very anti-Zionist. I don't know if, if Levinas was also in that way. Cohen didn't think there should be a, uh, he, he was opposed to the idea of a, of a Jewish state. And, and in that respect, Strauss takes the side of Spinoza against Cohen as saying Spinoza was a, uh, was a defender of the kind of early, early defender of the possibility of, Jew, of a kind of reconstituted Jewish sovereignty. But what Strauss didn't want to do, I, I have another paper about this actually, I don't want to go on too long about this because I've written a whole paper about it, which I don't want to bore, bore everybody with. Um, when Strauss wrote this Spinoza book, in 19, published in 1930, uh, Europe at that time, and also Palestine, was undergoing a huge wave of Spinoza mania, you might say. Uh, it was 1932 was the 300th anniversary of Spinoza's birth. 1927 was the 250th anniversary of his death. Big conferences were were carried out both in Jerusalem and throughout Europe. Uh, a big, a new edition of Spinoza's work had been uh, edited by a man named uh, Gephardt. Uh, it was a, a big renaissance of Spinoza's scholarship, uh, where Spinoza was going to be reintegrated into the canon of European philosophy and also in Jewish thought. There's a famous story in, the, in a conference at the very newly constituted Hebrew University conference on Spinoza in 1927, devoted to this uh, a, 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 a philologist and historian by the name of Klausner, uh, got up in Mount Scopus at uh, the Hebrew University and shouted out, Baruch Spinoza, you are our brother. <laughs> the ban on him is rescinded. Everyone was completely perplexed by who had the authority to rescind the ban. <laughs> when, when did Joseph Klausner, you know, acquire this? Anyway, so there was this huge uh, 
uh, renaissance of, of interest in Spinoza in the time that Strauss is, is beginning to write this book. And, uh, and he, uh, he ended up throwing a lot of cold water on this, on this uh, sort of uh, re re renaissance showing that Spinoza was in fact a far more problematic figure for the Jews than uh, he uh, than, than, than was being pre presented in, by, the, by, the, by, many, by many of the other scholars of, of, of that period. Uh, and then of course, uh, 1932, which marked the, again, the tercentennial of Spinoza's birth. Uh, we all know what happened the very next year, 1933. Uh, Hitler came to power, and that, that was the end of the Garden Party. And, uh, it was it put an end, put an end virtually to you know Spinoza. So much of the European Spinoza scholarship, particularly in Germany, uh, which has never really recovered uh, even to this day. So that's a, a that's a great that's a question that deserves a, a study in its own right. I think, but uh, please. Did Strauss give any thought to the evolution of Reform Judaism? I think there was only one. There was only one temple that Strauss recognized that was orthodoxy, and he didn't go to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think about Germany. And I think you know, you know, you know very, yes, right. I mean, and he worked on. He worked on this. Uh, he worked, uh, as I said, on this in. in is a young man who worked uh, as an editor on the, on the Mendelssohn uh, uh, work, the Mendelssohn uh, uh, collected work. And Mendel, we often think of Moses Mendelssohn you know, philosophically as the uh, kind of philosophic founder of, of reform in some ways, trying to create a kind of rational Judaism in some way. And Strauss, Strauss, Strauss was very uh, critical. He was very critical of this idea that uh, I mean, if we think if we think of reform as an attempt to kind of uh, rationalize religion in some ways, pick and choose the, those things that that, that seem that seem rational to a more rational. Person. Strauss thought that was exactly the wrong move. It was an attempt to kind of harmonize reason, reason, and, and religion. In, in doing that, he thought you, you really paper over, you you conceal and paper over the, some of the fundamental differences between them. So he, he, no, he didn't he didn't ever really write about the, the, the different kind of uh, you know divisions of modern Jewish life and conservatism and reform. But he knew he knew some of the people uh, when he was in New York. He, Worked with and with some of the people associated with uh, JTS and places like that, but it was not a, it was not a subject of his uh, writing. And he only, whenever he talks about Judaism, and, and again he does it, and I think in many ways in, in idiosyncratic, in interesting and idiosyncratic ways, it's always orthodoxy. He speaks. He always talks about Jewish orthodoxy. It was the only only kind he recognized. When and how did he get out of Germany? It was not difficult because he left before Hitler. He left before Hitler in 1932. He had a Rockefeller Foundation grant. He went to Paris to study and just never went back. Never went back. So it's not some. Yeah, he did. There's no good story connected with it. He had trouble. In, he had trouble. Uh, you know, like everybody, like most people, get most. Most of these emigrants, he had trouble kind of, kind of finding employment for a long time. And from the letters that I've read of, of the period in England, and particularly even even in the early years in the U.S., you know, he was really struggling and scraping by, uh, doing a, a guest lecture here, being a, being a filling filling in at different colleges and universities. There, eventually, he got he got settled up pretty, pretty well, but. And it, there was a period of, of, of struggle, but no, he, he left in 30, he left Germany in '32, and only returned once back in the '50s. On the way, on the way to Israel in the '50s, he stopped off and visited his, his town where he was born, and uh, visited. And uh, it was the only time he, he 
do with that. Um, well, you mentioned in the paper that Strauss um, realized that theology means fundamentally political theology. Yeah. And that sort of sounds like a reversal of yeah. Schmidt mm. uh, and sort of the suggestion that political thought or particularly liberal political thought is actually political theology. And so I was wondering if you could sort of speak a little bit more about political theology, but then also about Strauss's relationship to Schmidt. Yeah, uh, I think that term political theology, I mean, I, the way I used it, and I think I was trying to capture something in the way that Strauss thought of it, he did think of theology as, as at least Jewish, Jewish religion is fundamentally political in the sense that it was, a, it was, a, it was intended as a, as a code of law, a body of law to instruct and to guide a, a community of social and political life of a community. In many ways, he, was, he clearly distinguishes uh, religions of law from religions of faith. It's not a faith as he, as he, as he presents it. So it is, a, it is a political theology in, in that way. And in many ways, what he his reading of Maimonides and Al-Farabi and the, the Islamic thinkers of, of that <coughs> medieval era, period, era too, Focus very much on their uh, treaties, uh, their their teachings, as as political. I mean, he, he makes the prophet in, into a lawgiver. I think it's one of Strauss's big moves in the study of medieval political medieval philosophy by by showing the centrality of of politics to it. That the prophet is like a lawgiver, and. Uh, it's a mistake. He's got a whole complicated argument with other contemporary interpreters of, of uh, medieval Judaism and Islam who see these as religions in, in the modern sense as something internal. Uh, these are political. So that's what I mean in, in calling it a political theology. Maybe that is something. Maybe that is something he gets from this man named Carl Schmidt, the German liberal philosopher talks about also, who also talks about political theology. Um, yeah, did, did you have something else you were thinking about oh. along those lines? Well, yeah, I just, I mean, how much he sort of picks up this, this like, Schmidt means it mostly as a critique of liberalism. Right. I understand. I mean, and Strauss has his own sort of critiques of liberalism. That's a great point. Maybe, you know, like there's, a, there's a dissertation topic for you. <laughs> no, I think maybe, maybe it is connected with a certain critique of liberalism, because liberalism is precisely the movement that wants to privatize, depoliticize, depoliticize religion, turn it into a, a faith and a, and a matter of conscience, a matter of private belief. Don't get me wrong, Strauss sees a great deal of benefit in, in the sort of liberal of a liberal solution to the theological political problem. He, he praises and endorses the separation of s state and church and s state and civil society, public and private. That's uh, a very important move uh, in you know guaranteeing freedom and guaranteeing not, a, not eliminating, but, but at least mitigating some of the worst kinds of discrimination and persecution. But there's, there was something about Strauss which I think, uh, which uh, so many thinkers, his quality that so many other thinkers lack, which was that uh, he, he, he always saw that every political solution, every solution to a problem creates its own problems. It, it creates its own problems. There are no panaceas in, in, in political life. Is it, uh, I mean, maybe that's a way of reconfirming the statement that the, Jew, the Jews have been chosen to prove the absence of redemption. You know, that, you know we can't expect utopia, that a, a world he, he denied, or he, he, he at least he uh, didn't consider the possibility that we could have a world, a, a world where all discrimination was eliminated. All discrimination was eliminated. Liberalism, again, has shifted discrimination to the private sphere, but it hasn't eliminated it. He told a funny story about this. He told kind of a joke about this. He said he heard, he heard a story 
this again in the 50s, uh, he heard a story about uh, a group of Jews in Los Angeles, the farthest outpost in civilization in Los Angeles, far away. He would become, he would become a Unitarian and join the, one joined a Unitarian congregation. You know, the most liberal, open, tolerant religion of the Unitarians. One, one, then another, and another. Finally, there were, you know, six, seven, eight, who knows, members of this Unitarian congregation. And the uh, reverend or the minister of the group came up one day and said, Why don't you consider forming your own separate group? <laughs> <laughs> It's a way of saying we cannot solve the problem. You know, it, it, even even there, it hasn't been solved. So, uh, so, but my, but the point is that the, I think there's there's a there's a very uh, hard-minded, uh, tough-minded recognition that uh, every solution creates its own problems. As he says in that, this is, you remember from the preface to Spinoza, he says, no society, we will not have a society without contradiction." every society. And he, he understood that liberalism, while uh, admirable and, and, and much, to be, much to be preferred to any of the modern democracy, to any of the alternatives, we cannot blind ourselves to, to its problems as well. This, and I, I think it's because of his honesty about this that he's, been, he's, he's attacked as anti-liberal, anti-democratic. Because he dares to say that there are problems, that liberalism does not solve these problems, and, can, and can't, and can't, without ceasing to be liberal. That's, that's, the, that's the part about it. Can I one question? You see that, uh, if I, I touch it, you, yeah. you see that uh, Strauss returned to memory as a rationalist thinker? Mm -hmm. In what way? And because the middle, the, the middle age is a uh, age of uh, religion and power. So in what way my money is a rational well, I think in, I think Strauss did not accept the view that uh, he, he talked about a medieval enlightenment. He did not accept the view that the medieval middle ages meant dark ages, meant the age of superstition or, or, or something like that. And what I what he saw in Maimonides, uh, Maimonides I mean, Maimonides was, was the one he learned from Al-Farabi. He, he was in many ways that introduced philosophy. He introduced philosophy, and, and not alone, but to be sure, but introduced philo Greek philosophic tradition into Jewish theory. Yes, of course, there, there are others. But for him, Maimonides represents this. And it, it is this struggle to keep this tension. What Maimonides did was, for him, was to maintain this tension between, you might say, the claims of Jerusalem and Athens, and he had, he had, a, cert, he had a certain kind of way of negotiating that with the esoteric writing and so on. And, that, and it's in that respect that he, he can think of Maimonides as part of what he calls medieval rationalism. It was not the modern rationalism of the Enlightenment that sets itself to uh, undercut religion, to destroy religion. The modern enlightenment is called it's atheistic in its impulses. The, the, uh, the, the medieval rationalism of Maimonides and, and, and Al-Farabi in, in the Islamic world uh, made, it was moderate. It was moderate because it made, it made certain concessions to the religious communities and under, understood the conflict more deeply between uh, religion and philosophy. Uh, Rachel, I want you know, it was, it was about the point about how stress was uh, injected crypto my modern deism into the orthodoxy, so recently. What about it? Um, I mean, in what way did he do that? Um, like, how, how did, um, it seems that Strauss rejected the idea that there could be reconciliation between um, yeah. rational thought and faith, um, but if he, if he himself was in some way writing esoterically yeah. and being a crypto Maimonidean, did he think there was some possibility of kind of a workable solution for the political realm, or mm -hmm. were they just fundamentally irreconcilable? No, certainly not. Not irre I mean, I would distinguish between two forms of being irreconcilable. Something can be irreconcilable philosophically, 
but you can still reconcile it to politically. You can come to a kind of you know modus vivendi or something politically. You can you can work with a certain comp you can work with a certain compromise, and I I think that's what that was what Strauss saw that uh, in many ways the genius of of, of, of someone like like Maimonides his his public writings you might say could deeply underwrite and support the you know the, the Jewish community and he could spend his life being a, 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 a tender and a carer for for the Jewish community in, in exile and yet you might say at night his philosophic writings are are devoted to the to to the, the cultivation of of thoughts that you know when taken can be seen could be seen as uh, you know religion orthodoxy maybe uh, a kind of uh, global lie that the community needs to needs to sustain itself needs to support it. It's a little bit like the line, I don't know if anyone went to Robert Pippin's lecture at the other last week, uh, John Ford, uh, at, the end of, at the end where he talks about uh, you know, the man who shot Liberty Valance in the last line. And the movie, one of the last lines of the movie is the newspaper guy who says, uh, uh, when the truth, when the truth, what is it, when the truth contradicts the myth, you print the myth. <laughs> There's something to, to that, you know, Strauss, how you can get appreciation for the, the myth that, that maintains society. Very important. So, you said at the beginning of your paper that you were going to stay away from the negative and yeah. the positive, and yeah. it's basically did a, a brilliant, uh, it was wonderful to hear all the issues of uh, philosophical discourse. But can you comment on the negative? Yeah. And, and what I'm thinking of is Strauss in the contemporary political reality of being sort of powerful, shaken character with disciples. Right. And it's also interesting that you can engage in the study of anti-Semitism, you know, who can come at it from a wide variety of political and ideological and disciplinary perspectives, are often labeled as neo Right. Can you, can you well, you sure, a little bit, sure. I mean, anybody who writes on Strauss is going to be very quickly aware that, uh, particularly now, now that in the world of the internet, you just go there and you, I guarantee you, if you've never done this, type in Leo Strauss and you're going to find, um, you know, you're going to find a lot of stuff, but you're going to find very quickly a lot of uh, stuff that comes out of the Lyndon LaRouche organization and Jewish Nazi talk, you know, about him. And the, this idea that, that somehow that there is a, uh, this, uh, you know, it, it, it's it, it, it's a revival of the worst kinds of you know Zion, you know Jewish conspiracy theories, the protocol of the elders of Zion, this, this kind of mythological anti-Semitism, which you see on which you see on the web, and that Strauss. I mean, obviously, the respectable. You know, you can be critical, sure. I mean, and there are respectable, respectable, and even some respectful critics of Strauss, but. Uh, we don't we never do this kind of thing at all, but uh, you can find it very clear on the web that he is, there's something about Strauss that is, uh, I think you, you, you require a social psychologist to explain, to explain what, the, what it is, but you know, to, to create this kind of, I would say almost in some quarters, pathological hatred. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's unbelievable, it's unbe it really is, it's unbelievable, it's unbelievable. And partly because of this, uh, it's partly the reason why why I wrote my book. Because he just gets sick of this nonsense, you know. And, uh, and everybody's obviously talking about this, so maybe I should. You know. <laughs> but it, it's it's out there. It's a disease. It really is. I don't know. Yeah, I was wondering uh, what uh, Joseph Corpsey told you about. Leo Strauss as a Jewish thinker, because I'm Joe sure you asked him. Joe will say almost nothing. Really? Joe will say nothing. It's, 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 some, it's a source of bewilderment and frustration to me. Because in his classes, he usually takes the side of reason. Yeah, but so, you know, I, 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 I interviewed him, and he just wouldn't come in. 
And a second question, sort. Um, uh, have you Strauss read uh, Freud and to what extent at all? Yes, I mean, he has, an, he has a, a long review essay of Freud's Moses and Monotheism. Okay. Uh, doesn't like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he had. I, you know, I, I don't think he was a, a deep reader of Freud. And the fact that he choked, that he did review Moses and monotheism, he's clearly interested in that. Sort of Freud is an interpreter of the Jewish experience, rather than you know, Freud, the, the depth psychologist. So, but he, he did, yeah. Uh, so. You can get that essay. I don't have it. <laughs> it's in that Kenneth Green volume about uh, the crisis of modernity. Please stand up. Um, just a preliminary question, yeah. clarification. Before you perform my uh, you know, question, you mentioned um, when you were talking about the Jewish question, and you were um, you spoke about the two options offered by Spinoza. Is that your interpretation of Spinoza, or was that what Leo Strauss saw Spinoza as offering to the Jews? Well, I'm putting it in my own terms. Strauss, Strauss didn't put it in terms of these two options, but I'm sort of reconstructing it from Strauss's own reading. In my reading, in my reading I think that's basically correct. Uh, yeah, I mean, that those aren't quite, I, I would say he, he doesn't put it in quite those, those, those terms. Okay, well, yeah. I, I guess so my so question I, was, that those two options, either shedding any particularistic aspect of your identity yeah. uh, and becoming a universal right. citizen mm -hmm. versus living in your own state yeah. um, seem like two extreme options. Yeah. And my question is, to what degree did Strauss see a middle way? Mm -hmm. For instance, if he was living in Chicago. There are even orthodox observing communities right there in Chicago who are very active in every aspect of political, social, economic life. Um, and that's the same with it. Jews in many cities around the country. So, of course. Yeah. So no, I think, I think he see, he, I think he would, he would see that as part of the, uh, uh, yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, but I think that's kind of a variation, a variant of the, uh, of the first, op of the, of the first option. Religion has become a part of civil society. Uh, yes, of course, there are, uh, you, you can have, you, you know, you can have really self-segregating communities with, within civil society and organized around any lines that you like, religious or, 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 or whatnot, and that's precisely the value of a society, of a democratic society, with its separation of public and private. But the point for him is that he's, his community no longer have any legal force to them. They're it's sort of in Tocquevillian terms, they're kind of almost like voluntary associations, people joining together to live with other, you know, kind of like-minded, like any, like any kind of group. It just seems to, it seems to be quite different from the idea of a, of a binding, of, of a legally binding community. So, but I think you're right, it's not exactly the same thing as a, you know, sh shedding all uh, uh, aspects of one's identity to become this sort of unit, that, that kind of utopian idea of a kind of universal person, you know. Uh, but, you know. Monday we'll have a special lecture with Michelle Bayorka, who is the president of the International Sociological Association, and the center, he's the director of the Center for Sociological Analysis and Intervention in Paris. Um, and then next week we have a scholar, an important historian, Andreas Giro from, uh, from the Department of History at the Central European University in Budapest. So perhaps like Strauss, these are important issues of the day, and I hope some of the scholars will try to engage an important issue. And on that note, I'm going to thank you very much for the